Here is one of a series of talks by spiritual leader Lola McDowell Lee, spanning two decades from the early 70s through the 90s. Lola was a Zen Roshi, whose Rinzai lineage included Dr. Henry Plutov and renowned Zen master Shigetsu Sasaki. Lola was a religious scholar as well as an ordained Christian minister. While the talks are focused mainly on Zen and Buddhism, Lola drew on many spiritual traditions, including those of Jesus, Plato, Lao Tzu, the Hindu Vedas, Meister Eckhart, and Gurdjieff. And I read to you from the Gospel of St. Thomas. And Jesus said, If you bring forth that within yourselves, that which you have will save you. If you do not have that within yourselves, that which you do not have will kill you. And Jesus said, Let him who seeks not cease seeking until he finds. And when he finds, he will be troubled. Then he will marvel, and he will reign over the all. And he said, whoever finds explanation of these words will not taste death. Hmm? I think it is in this day and age of uh, so much psychiatry and uh, uh, all the other ologies, you know, that wherever we seek and whatever it is that we seek, you know, in amongst all these things, that deep within ourselves, what you are really seeking is yourself. Basically, fundamentally, we may not know it, but fundamentally, we want to know ourselves. Uh, we have construed all manners of things, all kinds of things to seek. And we're motivated by this seeking. We want this, and we want that, and we want the other thing. Now, when you find this thing that you are seeking out here, Say that you are hungry one day and you go out and you find an apple. You go out into the apple orchard and finally find an apple to make it very simple. Huh? Do you find yourself when you find that apple? Mm -hmm. In anything that you just grab. In seeking great wealth. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is that we are seeking more life, you know, to have the life more abundant through wealth. But it is life. And uh, maybe it's that some little something in us says, well, now, without money, how can I protect myself against death? And another person may be seeking power or prestige. Uh, what is he really seeking? Hmm? He is seeking to be so powerful that death cannot come near him. Hmm? And when he does attain that position, that prestige, and that power, and he looks around him, then the poverty of it is revealed. Hmm? This life, and it is what Easter is about. This life, as we know it, will end. Our search for things, hiding this search for a deathless existence. Now, instead of looking out there at the things, and we look at ourselves, we might discover that this possibility of deathless existence is already present within you. For this, you know, you look inside and you say, oh yeah, here I am. 
Hmm? The I am within you. All covered over, of course, but... Mm -hmm. And this I... within, you can't touch with hands. Because our hands move out to things. And legs don't travel inwardly. They go that way and that way and the other way. But not this way. Eyes move out. Ears move out. <clears throat> but the search for the deathless existence is a search for the inner being. And it is that that is deathless. And Jesus said, if you bring forth that within yourselves, that which you have will save you. That which is within you. It sometimes uh, is spoken of, we often do, as a seed of the divine. And in the Bible, it is also mentioned as a mustard seed. If you help it to grow, if you help it to manifest itself, that which you have will save you. But if you ignore it, if you miss it, there is no growth, there is no maturity to it, there is no manifesting of it, that which you do not have will kill you. So, encased here, encased Every here huh, is a seed. What are you doing about it? Hmm. What does one do with a seed? Hmm? Gosh, I can't even pick it up, you know? What does one do with this seed? Huh? Well, ordinarily, you have a seed, you put it in the earth, you put it in the soil so it will grow. Now, is this what you're doing with this divine seed. Maybe we've never thought about it. Hmm? Maybe we're afraid that if we really do this, we will die. That the seed is to be buried in the earth. Hmm? But any seed in order to grow must die. Only then is a tree born. The tree within a seed, the husk goes. The seed dies. And here comes this tree. Now there are all kinds of seeds. You know, Meister Eckert said that, you know, there are <clears throat> pear seeds mm -hmm. and they become pear trees. And apple seeds become apple trees and God seeds become God. Hmm? Yeah. You know, I heard a story once. Uh, there was a king and he was very puzzled. He had three sons and they were very strong, talented young men. Hmm? As they should be, they were. And it was very difficult to decide to whom the father should give his kingdom. And he was getting older and he needed to make a decision. So he went to a wise man, his advisor, and asked him what to do. And this wise man devised a plan and said to the king, you go on a pilgrimage. So following this wise man's plan, the king called his three sons and gave them each the same quantity of seeds of beautiful flowers. And he told them, preserve these seeds as carefully as you can, because your whole future depends upon it. When I come back in a year's time, you will give me a report of what happened to the seeds that are in your hands. And the king went away. Well, the first son, he was the eldest, and he was a little cunning and a little calculating. You know, he'd had more experience in the ways of this world. So he thought, well, the best way 
will be to lock the seeds in a safe because when my father returns, he will ask for them. Exactly as he has given me, I will return to him. And it seems to me, he thought, a great deal depends on what I do, so I had better do this carefully. And he took a great deal of care uh, to find the best of all safes. And he locked the seeds in them, in the, in the safe, and he carried the key with him for 24 hours a day. Everything was protected. And the second son said to himself, well, the seeds have to be preserved, see? But if I lock them up like my elder brother has done, they could rot. No. My father will say, they're rotten. They're useless seeds. So what am I going to do? Hmm? And he went to the market and he sold the seeds. Hmm? And these seeds were a very beautiful, rare flowers. And he thought, this is the best way. Sell them, keep the money, and when my father returns, I will purchase seeds again, and who will know the difference? Hmm? Seeds are seeds. The new seeds I can give to my father, and they will be fresh, and they will be alive. They won't be rotten. So he sold them, and he tucked away the money. And the third son thought, well, now these seeds have been given me. There must be some significance in this. And he was the youngest, and he was the, less, the least trained, shall we say, in the ways of the world. And he, was still, he still had a kind of an innocence. And uh, he thought to himself, well, now seeds are meant to grow. The very word seed means growth. Hmm? Growth is not a goal, it's a bridge. It's something that you cross, huh? It means reaching toward something. Little plants reach toward, hmm? They grow from the seed. A seed in itself is, it doesn't have much meaning until it begins to grow. Hmm? A seed, we could say, you know, is rather like a, the beginning phase. It's not the final state. So he went into the garden and he planted the seeds. And then after a year, the father returned and he asked his sons about the seeds. And the first son, oh, he was so happy. He thought, the youngest has destroyed the seeds. Now, how can he return the seeds? Not the same seeds. He threw them in the ground. And they've become plants. And they're flowering. Flowers are not seeds. Hmm? And the second son has also missed because he changed the seeds. He purchased new ones. Hmm? And the second son thought to himself, well, the first will miss because his seeds are rotten. They're useless. They're dead. The third is already missed because the seeds were to be preserved Exactly, literally preserved, same seeds. And he certainly did not preserve them, so I am going to win. And the third son, he never gave it a thought about winning. He was simply interested in one thing. Father said the seeds were to be, to be preserved, and the only way to preserve seeds is to allow them to grow. Now the flowers have come. Some seeds, you know, will be coming, maybe by the millionfold seeds. Hmm? And he was just happy that his father would be happy. And then comes the inspection by the father. Hmm? And he told the first son, you're stupid. Hmm? Seeds aren't supposed to be preserved in safety vaults. If you do this, you kill it. You kill a seed, preserving it. Hmm? A seed can only be preserved if it's allowed to die in the soil and thereby be reborn. Hmm? And he said to the second son, you did better than the first because you understood that seeds die. Hmm? But the quantity remains the same. And a seed, if preserved, multiplies 
a million fold. Hmm? You did better, but you missed. And then he asked the third son, who took his father out to the garden, and he said to him, I didn't put him in a safe, and I haven't sold him in the market. I just simply threw them in the ground. Hmm? These are the seeds. But now they have become plants, and they're flowering. Soon there will be many seeds. If you want seeds, I'll give them to you by the millionfold. See? And the father made him the king. Hmm? Simple little story. You knew the end when I started, didn't you? We, uh, in our lives here, we live in a manner of speaking a rather uh, isolated existence. At least we think we do. Uh, it's almost as if we are all on this ocean and we are in a little boat and we're moving across time. From the moment of birth to the moment of death, we're moving to another shore. From the shore of birth to the shore of no more. Hmm? And uh, we are moving across this ocean in our little boats, and sometimes uh, we ask somebody else to come and join with us in our little boat, and uh, they come and they go, and maybe they'll come again and they go. And we have accumulated in this little boat a great many things. So much so, in some instances, that the boat is half and round, you know? And we find it's very difficult to leave the boat because of our possessions. All these things that we have thought and everything that we have desired, you know, all these things that we wanted, they're here in this boat but they belong to this shore. They cannot go to the other shore. No one has ever been capable of taking anything from this world to the other. You know, when you die, how are you going to carry anything from this world to the other? Hmm? I would like to see you bundled up with your knapsack, trying to get it across. People have tried, you know, uh, taking the money into the grave and uh, all the things that were given the pharaohs, you know, to uh, use in the next world. Mm -hmm. So there are those realizing that you can't take your things with you. Uh, they begin to think, okay, I won't collect the commodities of the world, you know. And what I'll do, I'll collect knowledge. I'll get very smart, and I'll take that with me. Knowledge can't be carried over either. When the body dies, the brain dies. Now, where's your thing for all this knowledge? What counts when you die? What counts right now? Hmm? In this world, we find three types of people. There are the very outward-oriented, and they collect the things. You know, this is what matters, what we have and what people think of me, and so on and so on. Uh, the second type are not quite so outwardly oriented, so they collect knowledge. Uh, they collect scriptures, uh, different theories, and different philosophies. Mm. We're collectors. I'm not alone in this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then there is the third uh, person, type of person, who accumulates awareness, <coughs> hmm? who cultivates the inner awareness, who observes very minutely about himself until this awareness stands by itself, see? and whose goal then is to become more and more and more conscious. Yeah. And this is the seed sprouting. 
consciousness that we are, huh? this inner self, the son of the father, huh? only this consciousness goes to the other shore of wisdom. Yeah? In this body, both worlds exist. Here, now, both worlds. Hmm. There we, so we could say there is a world of matter, there is a subject-object world, all the, of all the things. Huh? It's a thing world. We have thingified everything. We've made objects of things. Yeah. And then there is the world of consciousness. Yeah. And which of these two you cultivate is up to you, of course. What is it that you're doing with your life? Uh, when Pompeii was destroyed, you know, there was this huge volcanic eruption, and it poured the lava and the ashes all over the city. And the whole city was burning, and people were fleeing, you know. Buildings were falling, and in the middle of the night here are these people scurrying around, running, trying to escape, but at the same time trying to take with them their most prized possession. Hmm? One was carrying gold and another is carrying diamonds and scholars are carrying their books. What would you take? And all of a sudden it comes to an end. What are you going to take with you when you try to escape? One man walking along, he had a stick, just walking along. He wasn't carrying anything. And there are those who were carrying all these bundles, you know, who were very upset. And understandably so, you know, after all, it, it upset their whole lives. The way they had been accustomed to living, it was all being destroyed. And this man, you know, walking along in all this crowd, as if he were going for a morning walk. And people looked at him as they scurried by. Couldn't you save anything, poor man? Huh? Is everything lost? And they'd run for fear he'd want some of theirs. Hmm? And finally, once somebody did stop a little longer and, and say, well, I could share with you. And the man simply said, oh, no, I didn't have anything to lose. I didn't have anything. All that I have, I'm carrying. You are carrying things of the world. I have accumulated only awareness. It may be a crisis for you, but for me, it's time for my morning walk. Hmm? Somehow, for whatever reason, we have turned away from the fact that death is important. Our whole lives are a preparation for death. To be aware in death. Hmm? To know what is happening to you, as Socrates was aware. Hmm? Whatever it may be that you are doing in this life, you know, you may be labeled a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief. Whatever. It doesn't make any difference because the inner search is the same. How to become more and more and more conscious. To unfold that possibility in you. And then even death cannot make you unconscious. So Jesus said, seek and do not cease seeking until you find. And when he finds, he will be troubled. Then he will marvel, and he will reign over the all. And we find ourselves in a very peculiar situation, because we are seeking something that we cannot see. We are seeking something that we cannot touch. In our usual way, 
Hmm? We don't know what God looks like. You may have a concept, but this is your concept in your world, in a world of things. Hmm? We don't know where we're going. Hmm? We move and we grope within ourselves seeking this. And then something all of a sudden occurs. We have a glimpse of something. And it startles us. And it doesn't fit in with our concepts. And so we are troubled. But we keep plowing along, moving, this groping within. And then something else occurs. And then we marvel. Hmm? You know, mostly it is said that when you find, you will be blissful. Jesus doesn't say that. He says you will be troubled. Yeah. Bliss comes when the crisis has been settled. Yeah. The seeking. Yeah. You know, somebody once said, God is the greatest catastrophe that we can come across. <laughs> hmm? Hmm. To meet, all of a sudden, this in a living experience, not a concept, you know, in that instance, what happens? Hmm? You will not be, and yet you will be. And it is as if one enters a bottomless abyss. And here they speak of now a zero. For the whole of the existence as we have known it disappears. And this is the placing of the seed in the soil. Hmm? After which comes the flowering. When the seed begins to sprout, the seed is resurrected. Whoever finds explanation of these words will not taste death. Now the explanation, not in words. I can stand up here all day long and explain, and it isn't going to help you. No word, no number of words is going to make you deathless. The explanation is a living experience. Only experience explains. Hmm? Whoever finds explanation of these words, whoever finds the experiences, whoever moves through this troubled state, you know, St. John called it the dark night of the soul, hmm? the spiritual night, the troubled state. One who has marveled and has come to see this mysterium. This mystery that we are. When consciousness becomes aware of itself, consciousness aware of itself instead of things, we use a symbol to describe it, and that is the zero. Just zero. Everything else is either plus or minus. Hmm? You're coming or going, or whatever. Hmm? In this zero, hmm? no plus, no minus. So there are no relationships, there are no comparisons, there are no opposites. Yeah. Now, people very often not understanding uh, when they read something, let us say, about Buddhism, uh, then there, this nirvana is to be experienced. Um, and they speak of nirvana as a zero. As if, and they also begin to think of it then as a, an extinction, annihilation. 
because nirvana does mean blown out. It's like you blow out a candle. The flame is gone. The candle remains in this instance. It's all gone. Huh? Look, you know, we name everything. And as soon as we apply a name to something, we think we know all about it. Hmm? All states known to man, man has named. Love is a name for something you can't see and you can't touch. You can't pick it up in your hand and you can't smell it and you can't taste it. But you know very well that love is. Huh. Yeah. Something is present that you can name. Yeah. Taste is something you can't describe to someone. But you do taste your food. You can't describe what sweet is to someone who does not know sweet. And there are, after all, many different kinds of sweet also. There's the sugar sweet and chocolate sweet and, you know, let's stop there. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> we individually uh, may not know a certain state. But these states are spoken of. They have names. So someone, somewhere, all down these long ages, has known it and named it. And it was thus that the Sanskrit language came about. This is a technical language for states of consciousness. So the symbol zero is a state of consciousness. All is extinguished except itself. So the Christ dying on the cross was not annihilated. Hmm? He was not, as we would say, absolutely no more. Because consciousness doesn't die. Now we look at the power, at the force of this world the creativity of this world. You know, at this time of the year, it's spring, and so seeds are sprouting all over the place. Some of them we don't want, you know, be it in the garden or be it in our heads. You know, the weeds. But people speak of it as a resurrection of nature. The, there is a creativity that arouses from its sleep. We have an ebb and a flow of this creative force. You know, we get up in the morning and we go to sleep at night. The ebb and the flow of the creative force. There comes spring and summer and autumn and winter. The ebb and the flow of the creative force. Within this creative force comes this body. Within this creative force is this body. It is a function of the total. It is a function of the all. Huh? And it is not developed out of creativity. Nobody took it out of creativity. But it is this creativity itself. This living body, this sensate body, this sentient body, the psyche and the contents, as well as the flesh, all of it, no matter where you look, in this body and of this body, dependent upon consciousness. And there comes the time in this ebb and the flow of creativity where there is a withdrawal, you know, and in this withdrawal, the body disintegrates. And we say, oh, he died or she died. And the elements which of which this body consists, return to the nature, the creative nature from which it was drawn. That's the first step. Hmm? Just as there is a first birth and a second birth 
and a third birth. Yeah. Now, after this first death, the psyche continues for a while, maybe a short time, maybe a hundred years. Hmm? Consciousness in the psychic world. This does not represent the resurrection. And in time, the consciousness again withdraws from the psyche, and the elements from which that vehicle was drawn returns to its source. Hmm? That's the second death. No body, no psyche. What's left? What remains? Hmm? Well, consciousness. Hmm? But with most people, this consciousness has not known itself as itself. And so it may just go to sleep. Hmm? Because that seed wasn't planted. It just returns to its source. And just like you do when you go to sleep at night. You return to your source. Consciously? With awareness? No. In the morning, you get up and everything's just the same as it was before. The same thoughts are immediately present. The same feelings are immediately present. You would open your eyes and say, oh, here I am. Hmm? You're resurrected every morning? Hardly. <laughs> hmm. And Jesus, when he was confronting the rabbis in the temple, he spoke of three days. You know, and he said, tear down this temple, and within three days, I will rebuild it. And they didn't understand him. But this is what he was identified with, what he represented, what he was, this creative power, the light in every man, and every woman too. This zero in us. And when he was crucified, three days in the tomb, three days in the abyss, three days the seed was in the soil, and something very mysterious is occurring. And on the third day, the emergence, and we call it resurrection. In this world, as there are many types of people, there are many stages, there are many states moving toward this resurrection, the resurrectio. <clears throat> there are those who seem to have very little desire and seemingly, seemingly no need to understand. And then there are those who aspire somewhat, you know, now and then you want to put your toe in the water, but the rest of the time let me be, huh? And then there are some, uh, and with the, they have this yearning that springs forth. Hmm? You know, what's this all about? Why am I here? From whence cometh I? Where am I going? This surely is not the beginning and the end of the whole experience, this little bitty time that I am here. Hmm? And so for these, the search becomes a prime motivation. It's a need for them. It's a hunger for them. And out of this need, growth occurs. And this growth in time pushes one, let us say, to the brink of an abyss. It is a soul-wrenching, soul-searching time. It's like someone trying to push a mountain, you know, they, the, the tears and the sweat and the agony, and it's all typified in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, all these many gropings within oneself in the dark, you know, you know, like little roots uh, from a tree, they, they grope through the soil. They're groping in the dark. 
but these little tendrils at the end of the roots, you know, they're little mouths, they're going to feed the tree. And so we grope through ourselves in this dark, this working in the garden, huh? in the midst of our zest for a normal life. Hmm? Yeah, you have both. You don't become abnormal because you have a need to know. And then individuation is established. Now, um, the individual. We all think of ourselves as individuals. We're not tied together that we can see. Yeah. But this individuation, there is a biblical admonition. Come ye out from among them, and be ye therefore separate. And we could look at that and say, but I already am. I'm in my own boat. I'm rowing myself across this river of time. Yeah. I mean that. Individuation, the individual, the separateness of consciousness from the content of the psyche, not from each other. Until this point is reached, you know, we're objectively conscious, aware of things. The body is a thing, my feeling is a thing, it governs me, my thinking are things that govern me, you know, they're all things. We're objectively conscious. And it is as if one were an individual, isolated, an island to oneself, separate from the Father, separate from the Godhead. That's how we think we are, separate. We speak of individual, but this is not actually so, in this sense. Hmm? It is so when there remains only one. Consciousness is one. We all partake of that one consciousness. You know, and I tell you every once in a while, we have given it a name. This consciousness, we call it I. We all have the same name. Hmm? It is not an eye consciousness or an ear consciousness or a taste consciousness. It is one consciousness, individual, isolated within ourselves. Hmm? Pure. That's pure consciousness. There's nothing but it. And it knows itself, and that's the seed. How can you plant a seed if you don't know what a seed is? In our states of seeming individuality, this ego function together with all the psychic states of the totality, you know, the culture and the race, and on and on and on and on, you know, which we have so strenuously worked with. Hmm? which is so prized, this ego function, you know, is so prized by each of us. Don't step on my toes. I might scream. <laughs> huh? See? We cling to it. We must be very attached to it, more so than anything else in the world. You know, this veil through which we cannot see. Therefore, the me in the blind. Yeah. In the, the final state of this anguish, of this need to know, this hunger to know, okay, this dark night, you know, all we want, you know, is somebody take this away from me. I don't want it, you know. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. We don't say it so gently, you know. Get it out of here, you know. We don't want this anguish, you know. But then there comes this capitulation to this something that is greater than myself. 
and then we can say, as thou wilt. Hmm? And the darkness covers the earth, and the veil of the temple is rent in twain. Yeah. And three days, three days later, Mary Magdalene, you know, it comes to the tomb and finds it empty. Mary, you know, a symbol of love. She wants to find the man she loves, her beloved rabbi. And the two angels that are there say to her, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Woman, why weepest thou? And she answers them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she said this to them, she turned herself around. And then she sees this man. And at first she thought it was the gardener. But this man speaks to her. Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, still really not knowing him, said unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And very, very quietly, Jesus said to her, Mary, and all of this love that he must have had for this woman is in his voice. Mary, you know, and she looks, and she recognizes, and then this, this, this joyful cry, you know, Rabboni, Rabboni, you know. She turned around, and she recognized the risen Christ, who said, I am he that was dead but now I live forevermore. Hmm? The transference of identity, we could call it, from the individual to the light that lighteth the world, and the tomb is empty. The resurrectio is complete. The seed has become what it was supposed to be. And he said, whoever finds the explanation of these words shall not taste death. For now I live forevermore. Happy Easter. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> May the peace and the power that passeth all understanding hold us and keep us in the love of the Christed consciousness while we are seemingly separate one from another. And I do thank you very much. If you find Lola's talks valuable, more will be posted in weeks to come.